thank you very much for this uh, very kind introduction and uh, thank you for uh, inviting me to come here. I'm going to talk about uh, material minimizing forms and structures, which is a joint work with uh, colleagues from uh, Theovin. And I'm um, going to talk about the problem which was actually stated first, partially solved first for more than 100 years ago, material optimal structures. And this involves talking about uh, equilibrium of forces and the Ri potential. And I'm going to talk about two different versions of the same problem, a discrete problem and a continuous problem. And each of it is an approximation of uh, the other one. So each is uh, a well-posed problem in itself and the discrete problem approximates the continuous one and the continuous problem approximates the discrete one. And you have to switch uh, back and forth between them in order to solve the discrete problem. You have to anti-discretize and in order to solve the continuous problem you have to discretize again. And uh, I'm also talking a little bit, if uh, time allows, on uh, solving uh, large systems of nonlinear equations such as uh, occur in these uh, optimization problems. Yeah, just let's uh, introduce a bit of uh, terminology. I hope that the projection is so that not too much is uh, cut off. We are talking about structures uh, made from uh, individual uh, members connected in nodes and sometimes uh, faces formed by members are covered by panels. And as a special structure, a truss, is where there are no moments uh, transported in the nodes. And for a truss, you have the forces in each uh, Remember, they are uh, visualized here by means of uh, red arrows for uh, tensile forces and blue arrows for compressive forces. And uh, what you have basically is the equilibrium of forces for each uh, individual member and the equilibrium of forces for each uh, node. And in each uh, member, you have a stress, which is the force divided by the cross-section area. So I write sigma is F divided by A. And of course, you have the constitutive law of the material, for example, for a linear elastic material, the uh, strain and the stress is proportional in this uh, very easy uh, one-dimensional case. Now, uh, there is uh, two different cases to distinguish and this that will actually play a role later. There is the statically determinate case when uh, the number of unknowns and the number of conditions, the unknowns are the forces and the conditions is all the equilibrium conditions. The numbers are equal, so you can actually compute just by using the equilibrium equations, the forces in the individual members from the external forces. And there is the statically indeterminate case where you cannot where the equations, what you get from the equi equilibrium are not sufficient to determine all the forces and you have to take into account also the deformations and the elasticity and uh, how elastic the supports are and so on. That was a discrete situation. Now let's talk about the continuous setting. Now in a two-dimensional continuum, stress is, uh, well, probably all of you know that already, but nevertheless, I'm going through that just to that terminology is fixed. Yeah, you have uh, virtual cuts along uh, two orthogonal directions, and the force along that cut uh, has uh, components per length, and they are called sigma xx, sigma xy, sigma xyx, and sigma xx, and they form uh, the stress tensor, which is a symmetric two, two by two matrix. And when you happen to cut uh, along two special directions, then uh, all the tangential components uh, disappear and you only have components orthogonal to the cuts. Then you have 
uh, chanced upon the principal stress directions and you have the principal stresses sigma 1 and sigma 2. Now the force equilibrium in the continuum, well, you can, uh, continuum mechanics is of course a highly developed discipline, you can ask them. Uh, the divergence of the uh, individual uh, columns in the stress tensor must be zero, so that is the force equilibrium condition. And again, you have the constitutive equations, which are no longer as easy as in the previously shown one-dimensional case, of course. And uh, they relate the stresses with the strains, and the strains are computed from derivatives of the uh, translations. Now, there is something which uh, everybody who has to do with continuous mechanics uh, knows about, is the so-called strain compatibility, which yields additional equations. So you have the force equilibrium, divergence of S is zero. Then you have the linear relation between the stresses and the strains. I did not write it here. And the strains are formed from derivatives. And uh, then you know the equality of mixed derivatives. First differentiate with respect to x, and then to y is the same as first to y, and then with respect to x. So the strains which are there, they are not independent. There is something which is called strain compatibility, and uh, you have another set of equations imposed on your stresses. So this divergence of S is zero is not the, the only equation which governs the stresses in a continuum. I am uh, mentioning that because it will be the strain compatibility which is absent in our situation, but the force equilibrium which is still present in our situation. Talk about the basic uh, question. First, the two-dimensional discrete case. So a truss in the plane which uh, connects uh, given points with exterior, given exterior forces such that uh, if uh, the uh, maximum stress allowed in the material is known, the number of material needed is uh, minimal. If uh, all the members of this truss are from the same material, then this basically means the volume of the truss is uh, minimal, or the weight of the truss is uh, minimal. Now, when you ask the structural engineers what kind of uh, structure would have a minimal volume or weight or would use up minimal material and uh, connects the given points with given exterior forces, then they tell you that there is no bending moments and no shear in the members because that would be ineffective use of the material. So from the mathematical viewpoint, we just accept this and say that we do not have a general structure, but we have a truss. Then all members are fully stressed. This is also something which the structural engineers tell you. So uh, each uh, member is just uh, so thin that uh, it is uh, strained to its maximal capacity, either tensile or uh, compressive capacity. You can ask the same question in a continuous setting. And it is uh, curious that already in the first paper by Anthony Mitchell, 1904, on that problem, uh, a continuous version of this problem was asked. The continuum we are using here is not uh, ordinary two-dimensional material. It is a so-called truss-like continuum consisting of infinitely many infinitesimal members. The mathematical model for that is a stress tensor field where the equilibrium equations are fulfilled, but the strain compatibility equations are not fulfilled. It does not correspond to any material. It's just a 
if you will, anti-discretization of a very uh, dense trust with many, many small and thin uh, members. In this uh, context of finding the optimal trust, it is uh, important to realize a result of Maxwell from 1870, namely that the sum of force times length of members is independent of the combinatorics and of the location of the interior nodes. This is a remarkable result which you, uh, I felt uh, like I would not believe it at first time when, when, when I saw it. So the uh, forces are positive or negative, depending if it is uh, tension or uh, compression. So the F is with sign, the L is the, is the force in some member, and the L is the length of a member, and the sum of signed force times length is uh, only dependent on the location of the points where the exterior forces uh, are acting and on the forces themselves. It is possible to see why this is true, at least uh, in a special case. And I want to show because uh, later I'm also showing another uh, such a situation where that same uh, kind of mesh occurs. So very quickly, we have a system of members with vertices Vi, Vj. We have the uh, uh, members themselves uh, by edge vectors, Eij is Vj minus uh, Vi. In each uh, member we have a force and what we do with the forces, we rotate them by 90 degrees. So this uh, Eij star is the rotated force. The capital J is the rotation by 90 degrees. And over each edge, we draw the force as a dual edge. And then because we have, in the two-dimensional situation, equilibrium of forces in each vertex, those dual edges, they are the edges of a quadrilateral. So you get a dual mesh where each primal vertex corresponds to a dual face. Each primal edge, Eij, corresponds to a dual edge, Eij star and uh, each primal face corresponds to a dual vertex. And uh, the length of, uh, you, yeah, if you ha now have for each edge, you have the quadrilateral spanned by the primal edge and the corresponding dual edge, and one half times the two edge lengths is actually the area of this uh, reddish quadrilateral. And then when you sum up all these uh, areas, then you realize that that length is the force and that length is the length of the member. And then you add just something which only depends on the given forces. And you see that that one is the total area and which is now no longer dependent on the location of the interior. Uh, vertices and uh, no longer dependent on the combinatorics. Of course, you have to take care when you are, have signs. Yeah? This is then uh, not so easily visualized. This is a photo of Anthony Mitchell, who in uh, 1904 in Australia first uh, posed this problem of minimization. He already had uh, the relevant results, for example, that uh, you can switch back and forth between continuous and discrete scenarios, so he already did that. And he already realized one of the important results that uh, in case both tension and uh, compression are present in an optimal structure, the members are orthogonal to each other. In the discrete situation, this orthogonality is only there approximately, but uh, in the continuous analogy in this trust-like continuum, the infinitesimal members are orthogonal to each other. So this uh, figure shows, for example, a truss arranged uh, more alike on the surface of a sphere, which uh, with uh, optimal weight uh, transports uh, torque 
along an axis. So this is a figure from the 1904 publication. And it's also interesting that uh, very early, uh, this uh, German book from uh, 1892, The Laws of Transformations of Bones, I do not know how, what it was actually transformed because I do, did not read the book. But uh, the reasoning behind these figures is that the growth of bones, the, the, the local structure is governed by the forces which are present and also nature op always optimizes. So if nature optimizes the total weight of the fibers, then they should uh, follow Mitchell's theorem on the orthogonality of members and uh, apparently you can really see that when you look at bones. Okay, and uh, Mitchell's uh, result is the following. Now this is very closely related to Maxwell's result, but Maxwell had that the sum of forces with sine times length of members is a constant. Now Mitchell says sum over all the members absolute value of force times length of member should be minimized for the structure to have a minimal weight, minimal volume. And the idea of proof is uh, the following. So first we have some material where we have limit stresses, a compressive and a tensile limit stress, sigma min and sigma max. The one is negative, the other one is positive. For example, with uh, steel, sigma min is just minus sigma max. And each member is fully stressed. So if we are in the optimal situation, sigma either equals sigma max or sigma equals sigma min. Now, you could argue that if a member is not fully stressed, you just make it thinner so that it is fully stressed, and making the structure having uh, less weight, uh, smaller volume. But this argument is faulty because in the statically indeterminate case, changing one member will change, uh, the whole structure will change potentially uh, the, uh, the stresses and forces in every member. So, but nevertheless, it's true, yeah? You, you, you can read it up. <laughs> and then, okay, now there is something here which unfortunately is cut off. What is force divided by stress? That is the cross-section area. Now, the cross-section area times the length of a member is the volume of that member. So that is the volume. And uh, that one by Maxwell is constant. So if you want to minimize volume, you can just as well minimize that. I think some absolute value is missing here, yeah? Because it should be positive, yeah? But uh, this is just uh, a factor times volume plus some constant, yeah? And when you expand this, and sigma is either sigma min or sigma max, yeah? It is not such a big miracle, but after some time, uh, what you get is just sum of absolute value of force times length. So that is Mitchell's proof. Under the assumption that you have really, uh, that each member is fully stressed. I already mentioned that in a truss-like continuum, infinitesimal tension members meet infinitesimal compression members at right angles. Now, if you think as uh, this truss-like continuum as a really, uh, as a finite truss, but with very small uh, members, then uh, um, which uh, represents somehow the continuum then the fact that you have uh, a truss at all means that you have no bending moments and, uh, and no shears. So basically, the members must follow the principal directions. Otherwise, this cannot be a discretization of the continuous state. So that, that would be uh, an argument why, uh, <clears throat> why we have orthogonality. Now consider this uh, functional sum of absolute value of force times length, which should be optimized for a uh, structure to be volume optimal. And you look at this uh, continuous situation again, and the uh, truss which is discretizing this continuous situation, then uh, the aggregated uh, force times length here in such an element. What is it? Here we have 
a force dl1 times sigma 2 along a member of length dl2. Here we have a force of dl2 times sigma 1 along a member of length dl2. So in total, if you take absolute values, that one is uh, dl1 dl2 absolute value sigma 1 plus dl1 dl2 absolute value sigma 2. So that is a discretization of the integral of sum of absolute value of principal directions. No. So that discrete functional discretizes that continuous functional. And in order to find uh, stress states, continuous two-dimensional stress states where uh, the integral of an absolute value of principal uh, stress is, is minimal, I am representing a stress state by means of the Eri potential function. Now, the equilibrium equations say that the divergence of each uh, column in the stress tensor is zero. Therefore, the, apart from some uh, permutations and signs, that stress tensor equals the matrix of second derivative of some function, and that function is the Eri potential. If the domain is simply connected, it exists. If it is not simply con connected, then it exists locally. And the eigenvalues of this uh, Hesse matrix, the eigenvalues of this uh, matrix of second derivatives, they are the principal stresses. So I have to find the function where I now optimize, they are called kappa 1 and kappa 2 now, these eigenvalues, where I now optimize the absolute eigenvalues of the matrix of second derivatives. If you know about the Eri potential, then uh, possibly you have heard that uh, Laplace Laplace of Eri potential is zero. This is true only, so this follows from the strain compatibility. So we do not have that here. So the, our Eri potentials, they just follow from the stress tensor and not from uh, the remaining equations which are also there. So for us, the Eri potential is just uh, any function. No conditions are imposed on the Eri potential. There is, and this is always something very nice, in uh, the interplay between uh, differential geometry and discrete differential geometry. So uh, in discrete differential geometry, one works with uh, meshes and its vertices and edges and so on, and one, one has uh, concepts which are analogous to the smooth concepts. For example, you can assign, in the polyhedral surface, you can assign a mean curvature and a Gauss curvature to the face of a mesh, or sometimes you can assign a mean curvature to the vertex of such a, of a triangle mesh. And uh, it is always nice when those discrete constructions have a separate theory of their own. If they are not just approximations of the smooth situation. So that, that would be just a numerical anal analysis and just uh, uh, use um, uh, finite differences instead of derivatives and so on. Yeah? Uh, in discrete differential geometry, one aims at the discrete theory, which is uh, still an approximation of the smooth situation, but it is also a discrete theory of its own. And uh, when you want to formalize that, this uh, when is really a discrete uh, theory, a discrete analogy of a smooth theory, but uh, is a discrete theory of its own, you are left with the relation between integrable systems and discrete uh, integrable systems. Yeah, there is a systematic work on this by Sasha Bobenko and uh, Yuri Suris. But, uh, here I am not uh, uh, thinking of such, uh, in, in such abstract concepts. Yeah? Here I'm just uh, uh, telling you that there is a discrete Eri potential, which is a approximation of the continuous Eri potential in the sense of uh, finite elements, um, but uh, is a construction of its own. Namely, if we have the mesh, uh, well, a 
truss, I should say truss, not mesh, yeah? So we have the members and we have the edge vectors, we have the forces, we have, by rotating the forces by 90 degrees, we get the dual edges and we draw the dual mesh which consists of the forces above the primal mesh, which consists of the original members. Then there exists a polyhedral array potential surface which projects onto the primal mesh which lies above, so vertex-wise and edge-wise which lies above the primal mesh we started with and such that each face of the piecewise linear array potential function has a because it's a linear function, has a gradient vector, and that gradient vector is a vertex of the dual mesh. And then you can have the force diagram. And uh, in this way, you can uh, interpret the forces in terms of uh, curvatures of the discrete array potential because when you take uh, gradients you see how steep uh, the face is. If you take difference of gradients you get the kink angle from one face to the next face. And uh, I'm not uh, showing you how this really works. I'm just showing you that it exists and it is nice. And I'm going over the slide. Now coming back to finding really a optimal truss for given external forces. So for example, suppose we are given the boundary of a planar domain and we are given exterior forces. We can just from that information at the boundary build one strip, boundary strip of the array potential surface, just the way it is constructed. And then we have to fill it in such that the integral of uh, sum of absolute eigenvalues of uh, second derivative is minimal. Now this is of course a, in itself a non-linear optimization problem, but it is a continuous uh, problem. The uh, combinatorics of the truss which will eventually fill this uh, two-dimensional region does not occur at all. This will be decided in a second step. Since the combinatorics is part of the solution, it was really necessary that we go to the continuous version and uh, solve for this uh, repotential surface. Okay, we find it. Well, this is a separate topic, of course, how to find it. And then uh, the members of the truss are just found by integrating the principal stress directions. Which is also a computational problem in itself. So suppose you have a, a repotential surface which corresponds to some stress tensor field and then you extract in each point the two eigen direction. Then there is ways in geometry processing where you can just find a quadrilateral mesh whose edges follow these directions and then you project it into the plane and you get uh, a truss where you can see this image how tension and compression members are distributed just for that uh, boundary conditions which are given here. That was the two-dimensional case, but what we really wanted to do is uh, shell-like structures. Here, the original theory by Mitchell no longer applies because the weight of the structure, of course, enters in all computations and we no longer have the situation that the exterior forces are known. The structure itself is a variable, the weight of the structure is a variable, and for example, we can no longer uh, 
have uh, Maxwell's theorem, which says that a certain uh, sum of forces times length is constant. That was only in the situation that exterior forces are known. But uh, when you look back at uh, the proof of Mitchell's theorem, I said I have this miraculous computation. Yeah? Some factor times something which is the volume, some other factor which by Maxwell is constant equals that. I would really like to rescue that because it is such a nice uh, discrete functional which has this nice uh, anti-discretization as the sum of uh, uh, integral of absolute value of principal stresses. Is there a way to salvage that? Yes, there is, because if sigma max equals minus sigma min, then this fraction is zero, and we do not need Maxwell to arrive at this conclusion. So for structures made of steel, it's still true that uh, material minimization, volume minimization, weight minimization amounts to minimizing that same expression, sum of absolute values of forces time length. And uh, the computations, what we did in the three-dimensional shell-like case are basically similar to the two-dimensional case. By projecting the stress state in a surface to the plane, we get the planar stress state. We get an additional equilibrium condition for the z coordinate of the forces, but the x, y coordinates of forces, that's just a planar stress state. So we can uh, basically just uh, 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 project and uh, of course there is the, you know, when you project the stress is in some tangent plane of the surface down to the x, y plane you have some factors. Yeah, you have the area element here, the area element there. There is some factor between and so on. Yeah? So I will not uh, bother you with this. Uh, what you get is, again, a continuous version of this functional which uh, expresses the optimality of a structure. It is the integral over that surface of absolute value of principal stresses times, uh, that is the factor in uh, the, 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 the area be between the, the sloped tangent plane and the horizontal plane. Now all computations uh, which are actually done are discrete. So even when I say that I find a continuous function, continuous a potential, or I find a continuous surface with uh, coordinates z dependent on x, y, such that something like that uh, is minimal, I have to compute uh, on a finite resolution on, in this case, a triangle mesh which uh, somehow fills uh, the initial data. In this special case, well, we have a two-dimensional domain with some holes in it, so these are the boundary conditions. The, the holes and the boundary are not at the same uh, elevation, but you can see a little bit uh, from, from the shading. And uh, the problem here is to find a surface such that corresponding a potential and corresponding uh, principal stresses solve that uh, optimization problem. That computation is done on a triangle mesh and all the differential geometric quantities and all the stress uh, quantities are uh, discretized appropriately. Uh, this is a big system of nonlinear equations. After you have done that, you find the principal stress curves. They are in the next image. And then you extract the quadrilateral mesh along those curves. And uh, maybe you also want uh, flat faces of that quadrilateral mesh. That is a problem in itself. So it is known that uh, 
a network of curves on a surface, if a quadrilateral mesh follows a network of curves on a surface, then the faces in this mesh are planar, almost planar, if this is a so-called uh, conjugate network of curves. So you can, on top of this uh, stress optimization, you can also throw into your optimizer the condition of conjugacy, so that uh, when you extract, after you extract uh, that uh, uh, curves and uh, find a mesh which is uh, approximately aligned uh, with those curves, you have almost a planarity and in a post-processing step you make them planar. So where is the structure? Here it is, yeah? So again, we have uh, tension and compression indicated by the colors of uh, optimizing the integral of uh, sum of absolute values of principal stresses yeah? is uh, done on an auxiliary triangle mesh and it is necessary to introduce a lot of auxiliary variables. So you have the z coordinates of course as the primary variables as the primary unknowns and then you have a corresponding uh, stress uh, potential uh, you, you need uh, not really the stress potential, but you need the derivatives of the stress potential, which are the stress components. You have the um, constraints like uh, equilibrium in the Z coordinate or equilibrium in the XY coordinates, which is the divergence of the stress tensor is zero. Then you have the principal stresses because they occur in your optimization. You have the relation between the principal stresses and the stress tensor, namely this, uh, that they are the eigenvalues of this matrix. And everything can be expressed as some nonlinear equations which involve only local variables. So it is not that any variable here associated that vertex is in any way connected to a variable there, yeah? But uh, um, it is a, a non-trivial problem to solve such an optimization problem of a highly nonlinear functional with highly nonlinear, uh, with nonlinear site conditions. And the way this is done is uh, by a method which we call the guided uh, projection. So it is a method which works if your system of nonlinear equations is uh, sparse, in the sense that most equations involve only uh, variables which are kind of located nearby, and they are at most quadratic, which can be done if you introduce more variables. Almost all equations can be reduced to quadratic equations. And if you have equations which are definitely not quadratic, for example, if you have proximity of your shape to a reference surface, so the distance function of the reference surface enters, then you uh, do local Taylor approximations which are quadratic. You are, you are using an iterative method for solving anyway, and in each step of iteration you can do a new Taylor approximation. So you convert, for all practical purposes, you convert your system of equations into a system of quadratic equations, linear and quadratic equations. And uh, the target function, which is also not so nice, is uh, also converted into a quadratic functional. So uh, if you have such a big system of equation, f of x is 0. So x is a vector of variables in Rn, and n is really big. And f of x is a vector in Rm. This is all the constraints. It's also really big, the m, and f of x is 0. So what you do is you linearize these equations, just a Newton linearization, and you get a linear system of equations. Usually the constraints are too few to determine a solution, and also there are redundant constraints. So the linear system which you get from here is completely unusable if uh, taken directly. So what you do is uh, you uh, compute uh, a regularized solution. Uh, the linear system enters in this way, and then you have some regularizing energy, which is, uh, well, you can put in all kinds of uh, usual regularizers like uh, distance from the previous or so, but uh, most importantly, your target functional is here. This is the target functional. So in, by... Uh, 
solving such a regularized linear system where the target functional is in the regularizing term, you managed to guide your x towards that region of the solution manifold of f of x is zero where the energy is uh, minimal. Say how such a nonlinear functional can be converted into something quadratic. I just write that one uh, as a square instead of an absolute value, and I give a weight, which is just the inverse of uh, the absolute value in the, uh, but not exactly. So to prevent the division by zero, we do some regularization even here. So by, you know, by, it's really cooking, yeah? It's like in the kitchen, yeah? This is not uh, numerical analysis as the numerical analysts like to have it, yeah? <laughs> it's a bit like add a bit, and if it doesn't work, increase the epsilon and so on, yeah? So if you have done such things yourselves, you will completely understand what I'm talking about. Um, anyway, this method of guided projection, as it is called, did lead to a satisfactory solution in the sense that you only, for the more complicated examples, you only have to wait for like three, four minutes or so, total computation time. These are just the same, um, uh, the same surface. Uh, here you can see the principal curves as extracted from the stress field. This is the structure which is uh, derived from this stress field and the right-hand figure is a visualization how planar exactly the faces, the quadrilateral faces are. So the color coding is uh, blue if a quadrilateral is exactly flat, and it's green if it is not so flat, and red if it is not flat at all. Where not flat at all means the, the distance between the diagonals of a quadrilateral exceeds like 3% of the uh, of the edge lengths or so. Not three, two, one, whatever. Yeah, it's better than 3%. This is uh, another, uh, yeah, this is the, uh, a, a rendering what somebody with knowledge of these matters, uh, I cannot operate the, the software, yeah, to put all the people in there has done of the uh, example which I showed previously. And on the right hand side, again, you see all the tangent members and uh, compression members of the structure. This is another result uh, derived from basically the same uh, surface. Okay, to conclude, so what did I want to tell you? This uh, volume optimization, material optimization of structures corresponds to optimizing in the discrete case of sum over all the members of absolute value of force times length. So this was proposed more than 100 years ago by Mitchell, 1904. And uh, we managed to extend it from the two-dimensional case to the surface shell-like case for certain materials, yeah, where the maximum tensile stress and the maximal compressive stress are just opposites of each other. And this corresponds in the continuous setting to the surface integral of absolute values of uh, principal stresses. The numeric, numerical solution was done by the so-called uh, guided projection method. And it's important to realize that uh, both the combinatorics of the structure and its geometric state uh, shape are part of the solution. So it is not the case that uh, the combinatorics of the structure is given and by moving around the vertices, you're trying to achieve an optimum, but the combinatorics of the structure is uh, part of the solution. It comes from the combinatorics of the field of uh, principal stress directions on that surface. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>